Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Cohen Hellens. I'm a multi-platinum mixing engineer, and you've probably heard some of my work with XXX Tentacion, Tripuet, Kanye West, among many others. Today I'm very pleased to do this masterclass with you guys. Thank you, Sonarworks, to bring us all together to do this. And I'm gonna show you guys how I go over an entire mix, as well as the usage that I have from Sonarworks, which let me bring up that point because I'm always traveling. I love my home studio. I like to be in other studios. I love the community in regards to being in studios with artists. But unfortunately, every room, every speaker, every headphone has not a flat response. So at the end of the day, you're dealing with frequency issues, phase issues, and none of that you want to hear when you're producing or mixing, because at the end of the day, it's about the music. And you really want to know, how does my music sound? And does my music sound correct on the system that I'm listening to? Or do I need to figure out what's happening with my system and my room to compensate for that? So we all know that takes a lot of time to figure those out. And at the same time, be mindful of it and be able to compensate for that while you're producing, while you're mixing. So at the end of the day, a company like Sonarworks is the ideal company that has come into life to make all of our lives way easier. I appreciate them a lot. I use it every single day, especially now with the whole COVID situation. Um, traveling on the go, it has all pretty much stopped. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm, I'm very headphone heavy nowadays because my setup has been uh, traveling with me and I've kind of gotten stuck uh, overseas. So the problem with being overseas now is I just have headphones that need to be accurate and I need to be able to monitor correctly. And Sonarworks Reference has been the ideal partner, should I say, in that instance. So Sonarworks allows me to work with headphones and make sure that at the end of the day that whatever I'm mixing is truly what I'm hearing in the headphones is true to the actual music piece that I'm mixing. So in other words, I don't hear the headphones, I only hear the music, and that's what I wanna hear because if the client presses play and they hear a mix that sounds entirely different from what I was hearing on my headphones, that's not a good situation. So if you guys are ready, I would love to jump in and show you guys how I do a mix. Let's go. The masterclass I'm gonna go over with you guys is a song by Mario called Luxury Love. You guys probably know about Mario. Uh, in my personal opinion, he's one of the best R&B songers that is around. I'm gonna show you guys my session, but first I wanna show you guys the way I've set it up because it's slightly different from what most of you guys are used to. The reason why I've set it up this way is because of the way I use my universal audio arrow and the ways of monitoring. I've created a virtual set, stereo set on the output to have my headphones tuned differently from the speakers. For the ease of use of this video, I'm only gonna use the main monitoring path, but I'm actually routing that to my headphones because then I can talk to you guys, press play, go over the session without having you know double audio coming in from the speakers as well. So let me show you this real quick first. So as you can see, my monitoring left, right. This is where my main speakers are usually on. I have a great plugin here called AB. Basically what I do with this is when I set up the session and go over it, I basically press the reference on B so it plays the reference that's loaded in. It's the rough mix of the song so I can get a general idea of where the artist was gonna go with this, what their feel was, what the producer wanted to do, and then hopefully I can bring the song home add that little extra 5% to make the record really, really ready for, you know, streaming, radio, whatever it might be. So having said that, it's always important to be able to AB because you don't want to start a mix completely blindly, throw the faders up and start doing your thing. I mean, it's great creative, creatively, but the problem nine out of 10 times is that an artist has been living with the song already for a few months. So they're very used to the rough mix. And at the end of the Day, the rough mix is truly the blueprint to where you want to build the mix from. 
So I don't want to reinvent the wheel and get stems in that are completely dry, no processing on there that the producer already did or the artist engineer. I like to have the stems in a way where I have the rough mix when I press play and pull the faders up, but at the same time, I can build from there. So it's not about reinventing the wheel, it's about polishing up the car, if that makes any sense. So that's what I use this plugin for. And then of course, you guys don't have this one yet, but this is the brand new Sound ID from Sonarworks. As you can see, I'm using the Focal Listen Pros. They have a nice preset for this, which is amazing. So I just loaded in the preset. Of course, usually this is enabled, but it's enabled on my monitoring output. And then that way I can listen to uh, how the music sounds truly without hearing what the headphone sounds like. And as you can see, if I turn the dry watt all the way down, you can see what the frequency response is of these headphones. And as you can tell, right around here between one and 10 kilohertz, I'd say this is about three-ish, if I'm looking quickly correctly. So there's a big dip. We don't wanna have that big dip because what happens is we're gonna compensate for that dip. And then what happens, the vocals are gonna be screaming at you and piercing in the ears, as well as this bump over here, which is the low mids, which usually are perceived as the warmth. So you already think like, hey, this, this song is either too muddy or, you know, it sounds very warm. Not a good thing. And then as you can see, the roll end, the low end, sorry, the low end kind of rolls off here. And the thing with that too is we probably going to compensate for that if we don't tune them by bringing in too much low end. So what we're going to have is the opposite from this curve. So we're going to end up with too much low end, no body to the song, which is the low mids right here. And then the vocals will be very thin and screaming at you, that very metallic sound, which is the dip that's over here. And then the high end, we might be starting to overly DS vocals because as you can see, there's pretty high peaks right here, right after 10 kilohertz and right before. So that's where the sibilance of the vocals are and even the, the sheen and brightness of, for instance, cymbals, hi-hats or certain keyboards or string instruments. So this is not ideal it's pretty much far from ideal so when we tune the headphones as you can see it becomes less 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 until it's pretty much flat all around the entire frequency response curve which this is exactly what we want to have because then we truly hear the music that's playing and we don't hear these headphones and this goes for anything because no headphones no speakers are truly flat and on top of that you're also dealing with speakers with face issues because a lot of speakers are not gain matched or frequency matched. So at the end of the day, are power matched. So what you get is that a left speaker is responding slightly different from the right speaker that can result in maybe a hole in the low end or some other comp filterings. And thankfully, Sonarworks will solve that problem too once you measure the whole room and measure your speakers with them. Then at the end of the day, it will minimize majority of those artifacts and issues so that what you're hearing is truly the music that you're creating mixing or mastering so having said that i am going to disable sonarworks real quick because i don't want you guys to hear the tuning curve and then think hey what's going on with this music so having said that because of my universal audio arrow is why i use two monitoring pads so disregard that for now it's just the way I've set up my session. And then in Pro Tools nowadays, you can create fuller tracks. So what I do is my entire mix, boom, goes right here in the fuller track. The reason for that is that it keeps a clear overview for my eyes of what everything is. And then if we scroll, you can see there's not overly a lot of tracks. But for instance, there is a group for the vocals. Now, back in the day, I used to use a bunch of groups. Nowadays, I've come to the realization that using less groups makes the mixes more powerful, more punchy, less flat, and a little bit more dynamic. Now, for this instance, for whatever reason that was, I think it's the session, the way I received it. The vocals were already grouped, so I kept the group. I changed the plugins predominantly and you know, gave it my own cleaning and polishing and compression, which I will show you guys in a minute. So as you can see, blue for me is vocals. So there's quite a few vocal tracks. And as you can see in the comment section right here, I labeled the lead vocals LD, LD, LD. So I know at least, hey, these three are the lead vocals. 
So of course, because it's all grouped, I put in a folder track as well to keep it, you know, the overview clear, at least for my eyes. Then followed by the 808s and the basses, which I always call a brown, followed by the drums. I always call my drums a red. And then the music, the keys, the synths, all of that, I usually call it those purple. Of course, it's, it's my personal choice. This is how I quickly can go in a session and be looking at things and be like, oh, blue vocals, oh, bass brown, drums red, keys purple, and then effect sounds green. And then all the way at the bottom, I have my standard uh, template effects. In this case, not everything is loaded in, as you can see over here. Uh, the ones I was using is just the vocal hall, simple hall, reverb. I love the R2 from Exponential Audio, nowadays Isotope. It's a very transparent, but very nice, sheeny feeling reverb. And I usually like to blend that with a play reverb. So in this instance, what I always use in my template is the Softube TR1, the TSAR one, I need to say. Uh, it has a really cool EMT play type preset that I've altered a little bit to my taste. I like that more metallic, warmy feel to blend that in with a nice expensive rich reverb like the vocal hall reverb i just showed you guys and then i have another reverb if i have percussion sounds that are too dry because what you need to look at for reverb is it's a front to back panner it's like your left center right panner in this case i should have said left center right reverb for you is front to rear so whenever you put reverb on something you blend it back into the in the background of the mix and that's why a lot of times I have a percussion chamber reverb sitting there. Just a simple one. It's, it's short. It's 1.6 seconds, 1.7 seconds. And what it does is instead of having, for instance, a percussive sound hitting you right in the face and right where the vocal sits, it's, it's not that nice. It doesn't blend well. So giving it a touch of reverb, it gives it just a nice little blend right behind the vocal so that the vocal is right in your face and clear. And the percussion is still very clear, but it's clearly spaciously spaced right behind the vocal. And of course, you know, you want to pan it slightly left or, or right so that it stays out of the center and out of the way of the vocal. So that's why I have, for in this instance, a percussion chamber reverb. Let me see where I've actually located it so I can give you an example. Yep, see, so it's the Tom's the Bossa Percussion and the Percussion Group. So I'll solo those so you can hear what it will do with that reverb and without, so you can kind of get a sense of depth. So you can hear it's, it's pretty boomy reverb. It's also pretty big tom, low tommy type feel. But let's see when I play it back without the reverb. You can hear there was already a little bit of reverb printed on there, which was great, but it was still a little bit too, you know, less little highs on there, which still made it perceived very close to, you know, your listening position. When I enabled the reverb again, you could hear that it was more richer, more fuller as a reverb. You also could hear that it slightly made a bit of a difference as far as the depth perception went for the toms. So we're going to do the same thing here for the Bosa percussion. That's with the reverb and this is without. This is really a clear example of how you could hear how the percussion was dry up front, in your face, slightly panned, of course, but as soon as the reverb came in, you could hear that it got spacious. It's like you're in the room with the reverb. It's no longer just right in front of your face. So that's one of the examples why I would use on percussive sounds that percussion chamber or a wood room, just to give it some space so it's not dry in your face competing with your main elements like the bass, the kick, the vocal, the snare. So the other two that I've using on the session, effect-wise from my template, are a real simple quarter note delay. I always keep the feedback very short. 
because what happens is I don't want to have it lingering around or having to go and you know another trick that you can use is duck the delay with the vocal so that whenever the vocal plays that the delay gets compressed a little bit so that it gets out of the way of the vocal I'd rather just keep the feedback very short so that it just catches on right after the word and completely disappears right next to it so that we don't have to go really creative and spend more time with creating the perfect ducking compressor for it, the time algorithm and all of that. Just ease of ways to make things go quick, to mix quick, to keep using my intuition versus having to go really technical all the, all the time. The other one is the half note delay. Same thing, same plugin, Echo Boy from Sound Toys. It's a nice blend that I like with slower songs where the quarter note is a little louder than the half note. It kind of gives a nice little swing and groove to the vocal and the vocal space that it lives in. So this is pretty much how I set up my session. And then what I do is I always have my mix bus here completely bypassed so that I can just click and see what the audio does playing into it where my gain staging is. So I always look at it and, you know, nine out of 10 times, it's going to say that it's, you know, maybe three or four or five dBs too loud. And then what I always do in that instance is clip gain. So I'm going to show it here real quick. I would select all the tracks, but then I would at the same time have all the tracks selected and clip gain it and would say five dBs down. And then I've pretty much like back in the analog days, pull down the, the input trims on the console by 5 dB so that whenever the mix hit hits the output that it's not clipping. I don't want to have a clipping going in. I'd like to clip with the plugins, not with the gain staging digitally because digital distortion, it's it's too metallic -y sounding. It's, it's ugly. There's no warmth. We want to leave that over to the plugins that were designed and algorithmically done to emulate you know, tube warmed or solid state warmed. So again, I bypass all my plugins on the master bus. And then I check what my output meter is saying, select all my audio and then clip, down, clip gain it down or up so that I have enough headroom, usually about 8 dB, I'd say, before it clips. And then what I start doing is I'll start bypassing the plugins one by one and making sure, you know, when the compressor hits that it's not, you know, hitting too hard, that it's just like a little bit of one to two dB of gain reduction. Cause I know at the end of the day, once my mix has progressed a little bit more, it's probably gonna hit about two to three dB. If it hits more than that, then I have to look again at my gain structure and make sure that I'm properly gain staging my mix into the mix bus because at the end of the day my mix bus settings never change they're always the same so having said that once i press play with none of the plugins on what will happen then is my output meter will read you know zero db full scale reason why is because there's everything on there you know and there's of course limiting on there and this instance, as you can see, there's some pretty big EQ curves. The reason why this was done is because the roof was a lot brighter than the audio stems that I had. So I know that the engineer that did the roof mix put in a bunch of high end on the, uh, on the roof mix. So I had to make mine match that brightness. Usually when I'm um, doing a mix, I usually have it sit on analog and, you know, a little bit of, yeah, maybe 2dB at 60, just a low end bump so that it bumps a little bit more. I added mid range here, probably because I felt I could get away with a bit more uh, aggression. I wouldn't necessarily say aggression, more urgency, I should say. That's a better word. Urgency on the record because of the lyrical content that was there without it sounding too harsh. And then usually this one is not on at all the last band or the mid band for that instance. But this one is, I usually do a slight little EQ curve right after 3000 Hertz just to give it some richness in the mix. So to go back to what I was saying with the zero dB full scale, 
or my output meter, that's because my maximizer is hitting. And my maximizer, I don't mind that there's the occasional overshoot of distortion with, you know, a decimal or two decimals of a dB. Um, you know, it just makes the mix sound even more powerful. And that's the reason why the output meter will read zero dB full scale. So having said that, at that point, I can press play. The mix that I have without anything on there will sound pretty much identical in loudness and feel and everything as the rough mix. Sometimes, like I just said, there's maybe an issue where my rough mix sounds less bright or the mix sounds too bright and that's where I compensate on a master bus because that's the quickest way to bring it back to where the producer or the engineer originally had the rough mix. So let's jump in. Let me play let me play a little bit of the verse going into the uh, into the hook and then I will go over a few of the things that I did starting probably with the vocals. Yeah, I know this love existed. I'm just happy you came to your body. We going and going, no stop. Baby, you give me no options. You know I got you. You know I love you. I know how to keep you. That luxury love, whatever you need. For you ain't too much. Take as much as you need to. That luxury love, luxury love. Feel it. Yeah, I know. So you can hear clearly now how the delay just goes real quick and is gone same with the verbs it's, it's a real richness let me solo the vocals Filled it, yeah. i knew this love existed i'm just happy you came to you let me take part of the hook and a part of the post hook and i'll go over the treatment of the vocals and also play them with the effects and with the without the effects so you can hear the difference Whatever you need, for you ain't too much Take as much as you need to, the luxury love yeah. Luxury love Luxury, luxury love Luxury love was missing It's just a luxury with me Luxury love Luxury, luxury love Luxury love was missing uh, Whatever you need, for you ain't too much Take as much as you need to, the luxury love yeah. Luxury love as you can see, the combination of that vocal hall with the EMT plate gives it a real rich, luxurious feel. And the quarter note and the half note, especially with the automation, make it nice little flow and groovy, filling out the empty pockets of the vocals and the instrumentals so that it's a nice, real smooth record. So, on the vocals, it's very simple. Some compression. Uh, whatever you need, for you ain't too much. Take as much as you need to, the luxury love. Yeah. So there's two ways for me to compress vocals. I always use an 1176, but there's two ways. I either do it soft with about 3 dB of gain reduction, or in this instance, I smashed it because I think the Pro Tool session of the vocals they were pretty much smashed with a similar plugin, about 10 dB as well. So, you know, it all comes down to the ear. What, are, what am I hearing? Do I want to have a more compact sounding vocal, more in your face vocal, or do I want to have it a little bit more laid back and therefore pull back on the gain reduction? So that's what I did with the compression. EQ wise, I love to do dynamically when I'm carving because if I do it statically, nine out of 10 times, you remove too much of the vocal timbre. So if there's a little bit too much muddiness happening and you statically EQ it out, then at the end of the day, the whole entire vocal will suffer from it instead of whenever that frequency hits. So whenever that muddiness comes out, a dynamic EQ will compress that down so it stays clean and evenly all around. Uh, whatever you need. For you ain't too much Take as much as you need to The luxury love yeah. Luxury love Luxury, luxury love Luxury love was missing It's just a luxury with me Lux So that's without the dynamic EQ enabled I'll enable it again now so you can hear how it sounds with it uh, Whatever you need 
For you ain't too much Take as much as you need to That luxury love yeah. Luxury love Look. As you could hear With the dynamic EQ enabled The vocal was a lot more smoother More clear Nice clarity on the wording Versus when it was disabled Where you could hear the vocal being a bit too boxy And not as rounded off as with the EQ So that's why I use dynamic EQ to just clean up and carve out the vocal. Then I DS, I usually DS. Um, you know, this, this is standard when you pull up the DSer, at least this DSer. I don't change the settings, the only thing I change is the threshold and I usually have the vocal hit about, you know, minus six dB as a starting point. And then depending on if I feel like it's too sibilant still, I will remove more. Or if I think it becomes more of a lisp, then I know that I'm DSing too hard. Whatever you need, for you ain't too much Take as much as you need to, that luxury love yeah. And this is without uh, Whatever you need, for you ain't too much Take as much as you need to, that luxury love yeah. uh, Whatever you need, for you ain't too much Take as much as you need to, that luxury love yeah. As you could hear, especially the T's, the T's of the wording became less apparent, less transient, so less like hitting in your ears, like your eardrums rumble. So that's much clearer. And then for coloration, I always love the SSL sound. So usually for coloration, I add, you know, the SSL. In this case, there's not much happening. Usually I add some top end around 10 kilohertz because I like that nice sheeny sound of the SSL or the very famous mid-range which is happening here so I'll play back the record the vocals with the plugin enabled and I'll disable the plugin so you can hear what it sounds like without the SSL saturation the non-linearities from the SSL as well as that mid-range that famous SSL mid-range that we all are so familiar with from hearing on the radio uh, whatever you need for you ain't too much Take as much as you need to The luxury love yeah. Luxury love uh, Whatever you need For you ain't too much Take as much as you need to The luxury love yeah. Luxury love As you can hear I just added a 2.9 dB With a pretty broad Q setting So the quality of the slope Which is pretty wide And uh, a little over one kilohertz just to bring that presence out as you could hear there's a lot of presence coming out of that vocal without it being too harsh and too piercing in your face i did roll off a little bit on the low end because i don't like you know the boominess the proximity effect of the vocals sometimes what happens i'll use the uh, low shelf to shelve off some frequencies anything below 500 450 hertz so that that whole proximity effect leading up to it gets brought down and cleaned up and smoothened out this was not the case in this this song i didn't need to do that but the other thing usually i have parallel compression in this case i did not do it for the simple fact that i was hitting the 1176 at 10 db gain reduction which is very hard and i didn't want to start over compressing the vocals but usually i add a parallel chain in there to do a similar compression with an 1176, pretty much compress it completely flat and then add a pool tag or a tube tag type EQ and put in some low end or remove some high end so that it lifts the vocal out of the mix. So you gotta remember, low end is solidness and volume that lifts any element out of the mix. That's why I'm such a big fan of parallel compression. So let me play back the vocal part here, the pre-hook, and or the hook I need to say, and I will play it back without anything on there. And I will play it back with everything on there. So this is the dry vocal. You know I got you, baby. You know I love you, girl. I know how to keep you. The luxury love. Whatever you need. For you ain't too much. Take as much as you need to. The luxury love. Yeah. Luxury love. No options. You know I got you, baby. You know I love you, girl. I know how to keep you. That luxury love. Whatever you need. For you ain't too much. Take as much as you need to. 
the luxury love as you can hear the vocals really came to life sounding very smooth very rich very poppy and in your face so that's how i treated the vocals so let me go into the instrumental i don't usually like to treat a lot of stuff on the instrumental nine out of ten times it's to fatten up a little bit here and there drums especially and bass if need be 808 usually i want to add some upper harmonic distortion so that it cuts through more on you know your laptop speakers in-ear headphones little earbuds your iphone or other phone speakers just a small system tv speakers because if it's not there then those low sine waves usually are not being reproduced on those little systems and it's it's a groove element that still needs to be felt or hear, heard to a degree to make the record move the way that it's intended so let me show you this here's an 808 i'll solo it So as you can hear, it's, it's a very low 808. It's not as clean as the traditional 808. Um, what I'm gonna show you first is I'm using a multi-band sidechain. And as you can see, I'm only using the first band in the 90 Hertz. The reason for that is when the kick, and I'll solo the kick with it as well. When we play the kick, You can hear when I play it without that side chain going in, without the bass being ducked by the kick, it kind of becomes a little bit of a mushy thing. It kind of blends all together. There's no clear definition. You don't really hear that kick, that knock of the kick coming in, so that the chest punch. And by only removing anything under 90 hertz ducking wise in volume, is that the ear perceives it as if the bass is completely flat playing. And because of the masking effect that our ears do, also the principle that, it, you know, the good old MP3 is based on, it thinks that the bass is just there. Nothing is happening to the bass. It's there, the kick is just louder. Which, in this case, it's not. It's really compression happening when the kick hits at the same time when the bass hits. So that's why I compress only the low band of the 808, so it's much cleaner and less, you know, EDM style, you know, ducking. Now the other thing that I did on this 808, so this is the 808 with the ducking happening but without that upper harmonic distortion. And this is with the upper harmonic distortion. As you can hear, the bass became more prominent. It, it added some warmth and upper mid-range to the bass that was missing when I didn't add it on there. So what I use is a parallel chain. So this is the original 808. Didn't do anything with there except I did some side chaining so that I could duck below 90 hertz on the bass whenever the kick is playing, just to make it clear, less boominess. You know, everything its own space, the fine space. And then I added a multiband split on there. And then the multiband split, I only want to distort the frequencies above 90 hertz. If I distort the frequencies below 90 hertz of the whole frequency spectrum, I'd be getting that real nasty sounding 808 sound that didn't fit the purpose of the song. It can fit all the songs that might need a bit more aggression, more trappy type songs. It can really work for those, but not in this instance. So what I did is I completely muted or took out anything below 90 hertz because i don't need it and then above 90 hertz add a little stump box so this is pretty much the uh the ebanas ts808 stump box it's a tube uh, distortion that you can find in other plugin manufacturers as well um, you know they have so many have emulated this one uh, for the ease of use i use this within 
the system that I'm using with the Studio Rack from Waze because it makes everything real easy combined in one plugin for me. So I don't have, you know, a couple of plugins all lining up in each channel. It's just I pull it up and I can mess around and do my parallels without creating auxiliary sends and go through that whole motion. Again, it's a lot of technical stuff that takes a lot of time versus I want to do this quick and I want to go back to the mix so that I can keep mixing with intuition and feel versus having to stop do all the routing, set everything up, spend a bunch of time with that, which all gets taken away from a being creative and intuitive with the mix. And it takes away your, your focus on the mix, focus on what you're hearing and what you're feeling, what you want to address or what you want to enhance. So that's what I did on the 808. Very clear, very simple. And then the drums, very simple too. I'll play them, I'll solo them, and uh, you'll hear what I did. can hear I did add some reverb with that percussion chamber on the snare. You could hear when it was dry, it was really in your face, ugly, didn't give it a sense of space that, that a record like this would need. So I added some to it and as you could hear it went from oof, right there to, hey, it's sitting there, but it's nice in the room. I'm in the room with the singer, with, you know, the elements of the mix. It's, it's like you're a part of the experience. So first, what I want to address is the kick drum. So let me solo the kick drum. So that's a kick drum with any other processing on there. As you could see, I didn't do anything with the original kick drum sound. I didn't want to change the timbre, thought it was fine. The only thing that I felt that it needed was some more definition and more punch, more cutting through. Something that I could not add on the kick itself. If I did it on the original kick sound, then the problem we would run into is that at the end of the day, the kick timbre, the tonality of the kick that the producer chose for a purpose will drastically and dramatically change and will sound like a completely different kick. So what do you do? You create a parallel chain. So on the parallel, I compressed it completely flat, put it that way. As you can hear, it became a bit more transient and flattened out. And then what I did is I'll add a pull tag type EQ to it. I'll pull them both up and let them both sit here. So after the DBX, it's a really quick VCA compressor. I love how it adds that little thump to the kick. And after that, I can do what I want with the kick drum. So in this instance, I felt that I needed to add a punch and this is really a lot of 100 hertz usually i'm at 60 i'll play it back and play it with 60 hertz and then i switch it back to 100 so you can hear the difference in frequency cycles So with 100, it's less boomy. It's still boomy, but it's more rounded off. It gives more of a lift versus just the 60, which was more of like a, a ball and a low end. That's not desirable in this case, or at least I didn't feel like that was desirable for this record. Then the other thing I did is I removed everything above 20. I think because there was a small peak happening at the end. Um, could be uh, an issue of like aliasing when people do samples and you know they you know sometimes it messes up uh, you don't set the right preferences for it you don't do it the right way then you end up with aliasing and that way you know it smooths it out a bit more so this is the parallel kick with the compression and the eq on there and then i'll bring in the original kick and see how this blend sounds together and then I'll play it without again and play it with again so you get the overall experience. So this is just a parallel. As 
you could hear it sounds a lot fuller and bigger than the original kick sounded. So let's see what I did with the snare, which is going to be a similar principle in essence. As you can hear, the same thing happened with the uh, with the snare. It became much fuller, much more present, much more in your face, much more weighty, which is something that really this record needed. So I'll play the instrumental. And then what I will do with the instrumental, let me mute his vocals real quick. There we go. So I'll bypass the plugins. So I'll take the bass part as well so you can hear that 808 again and then the drums, how it sounds with the effects on and without the effects. can hear the 808 came through a little bit better the drums hit slightly a bit harder more fuller and that's you know totally what this record needed without it it just sounded thin flimsy it sounded still great because it's a great record but it needed some love some help to add in you know that little punchiness the little bit of warmth and then overall there's not much that I did there was not much that I felt instrumentation wise that was you know in the way of where the vocal needed to be or in the way of where the drums needed to be or vice versa. So the only thing that I really got going on here is the uh, xylophone where I rolled off some low end and there's some dynamic EQ happening to just keep it in, you know, in, in control, so to speak. And this is without the, uh, you know, a little cleaning up with the dynamic EQ. So as you can see, it's very, very minimal, very minute. It's less full, there's less body happening, but it fits perfectly because you always have to play it in context with the rest of the mix because at the end of the day, you know, we are mixing for the forest, not just for the tree. You just don't want to have a forest with one really nice, good looking tree. I'm going to go into the forest and see a nice forest. Not just like, let's go to the forest because it has that one tree. No, I want to see that entire forest blooming that it looks all good. So that's what we're doing with music too. Because if we just solo elements, we might be like, oh, this sounds a certain way or that sounds a certain way. But there's sometimes things that happen layer wise with, with a kick and a bass or a pad sound and a lead sound that mush it together and kind of create this nice little groove or vibe that needs to be there. And if you do it individually, you might make something stand out too much, too clean, too big, too nice versus the overall bigger picture which is the song itself because that's what's selling so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to play back the hook 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to AB it so you can hear the difference between the rough mix and my mix. So this is my mix. You know I got you, you know I love you, I know how to keep you, that luxury love, whatever you need, for you ain't too much, take as much as you need to, that luxury love, luxury love, luxury, luxury love, luxury love was missing, it's just a luxury with me, luxury love, luxury, luxury love, and this is the rough mix that I worked off. No options. You know I got you, baby. You know I love you, girl. I know how to keep you. That luxury love, whatever you need. For you ain't too much. Take as much as you need to. That luxury love, yeah. luxury love, luxury, luxury love. Luxury love was missing. It's just a luxury with me. Luxury love. Luxury, luxury love. Luxury love was missing. It's just a luxury with me. Options, options. You know I got you. You know I love you. I know how to keep you. That luxury love. Whatever you need. For you ain't too much. Take as much as you need to. That luxury love. Luxury love. Luxury, luxury love. Luxury love was missing. It's just a luxury with me. Luxury love. Luxury, luxury love. Luxury love was missing. It's just a luxury with me. Luxury love. So that's quickly how I did this mix. It's very minimal because at the end of the day, it's all about serving the artist, serving the record versus, hey, I want to make this stand out in a way where it's so technical and mixed in a way that, you know, people are going to be like, wait, who's that mixer? No, it's about. This is a great sounding record. They, you know, nobody's going to care in essence, you know, who the people behind the artists were. It's all about, hey, this artist came out with a new song. I love the song. It sounds great because that's at the end of the day what the consumer, the listener wants to hear. And that's what we're here for to serve. That's our purpose to make the record as best as it can be potentially for the artist. So I hope this gave you a little bit of insight of how I did this mix. Simple. You know, very intuitive. And hopefully this helps you guys creating better mixes on your end. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for watching. Take care.